Good evening, everyone. I feel like I really don't need this microphone, but <laughs> since, it's since it's here. So uh, thank you for being here. My name is Paul Lakeland. I direct the Center for Catholic Studies, and I think I am welcoming you on behalf of the Center for Catholic Studies and the O'Callaghan family to the 18th annual Andromeda O'Callaghan Lecture. It's amazing, 18 years that we've been doing this. Um, I'm going to say very little except just the usual routine that um, after the speaker we'll have time if you want to raise questions and so on and I will have a microphone I'll carry around so we can, everyone can hear you and what you have to say will then be on the videotape. So be careful what you say. Um, other than that, I think it's pretty straightforward. So the, um, as always, uh, we ask one of uh, our colleagues from the university to introduce tonight's speaker. So I have asked uh, Andrea Canwell to speak and to introduce our speaker. Andrea is uh, the Associate Director of the Center for Faith and Public Life and spends her time promoting service learning, a very important dimension of the university's work. So, Andrea, come and introduce Michelle. Thank you, Paul. So we are so pleased to welcome Dr. Michelle Saracino to Fairfield as this year's speaker for the Andromeda Callahan Lecture on Women and the Church. Dr. Saracino is a professor in the Department of Religious Studies at Manhattan College, where she has taught for the past 15 years. Her scholarship and research focus on the intersections among theological anthropology, contemporary continental theory, psychologies of the self, and expressions of religiosity in everyday life. Currently, she is exploring the spiritual and ecological implications of water and water-related practices, including baptism, bathing, and swimming. Dr. Saracino is the author of four books. Her most recent book is Christian Anthropology, An Introduction to the Human Person, which deals with the important and sacred relationship between humans and non-human animals. Another of her works, Clothing, a Christian Exploration of Daily Living, examines the spiritual and emotional anxiety we negotiate through our adornment practices and has recently been published in a Chinese edition. As a woman who can be found many mornings, mouth agape in her closet, debating about what to wear, I can deeply appreciate the spiritual and existential questions to be explored on the topic of clothing, so thank you. Uh, Dr. Saracino was awarded the First Place Book Award in Theology by the Association of Catholic Publishers in 2012 for Being About Borders, a Christian Anthropology of Difference, which examines the theological implications of the borders of self, religion, and place, and provides an important theological framework for how we as Christians understand the challenges and opportunities of living in a globalized and increasingly interconnected world. She has also published various essays and academic journals and collections on issues related to theology and difference, specifically about gender. She's also contributed to the National Catholic Reporter, writing book reviews in the areas of religion, ecology, and culture. Dr. Saracino completed her undergraduate degree at Duke University with a major in English. She continued her studies at Yale Divinity School, earning a master's degree in religion, as well as a doctorate in religious studies from Marquette University. Originally from Long Island, she now lives in uh, uh, Westchester with her husband and two children. So on behalf of the Center for Catholic Studies and the university and the O'Callaghan family, please join me in welcoming Dr. Michelle Saracino. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this evening, and I'd like to thank Professor Paul Lakeland, where is he? Hi. For inviting me to Fairfield. Um, Miss Mary Crimmins, I don't think she's here, but she organized, oh, hi. Okay, <laughs> organized everything, thank you. And um, the generous family of Andrummy O'Callaghan, and we had a beautiful dinner together, so thank you for welcoming here, me here tonight. Tonight, I'm going to ask you to imagine all the sacred, all the places between you and others as wild. 
And what I mean by wild is anything or anyone that is unknown, and if it's known, then not domesticated, undomesticated. My hope is that if we hold the same attention and survival strategies in our interpersonal relationships as we do when we are in the wild, we have the potential to create deeper, more empathetic relationships with all creatures in our midst human and non-human. Let's see what happened. We were set, Anthony. Let's start. I got it. We're good. This first slide is a brief sketch of the stages of my presentation. I'm gonna move from defining wild places to exploring the notions of wilderness and scripture, theology, and psychology. In the third section, I'll emphasize strategies for engaging the wild, namely being attentive, or what I call intentionality, improvising, and letting go. Then I move to sharing a personal way of reflecting on what it takes to navigate the wilderness. For me, that's through swimming. In the last section, I suggest that embracing the wild in our interpersonal relationships is a way to encourage empathy in our lives. Empathy allows us to stay connected with others who are different from us, learn from them, and grow. In this moment, empathy has the potential to bridge the religious, political, and cultural divides that seem to permeate our world. So let's begin by considering what makes something wild and what constitutes wilderness. Any place or event or being that is foreign to us in some way is wild. Be, to be sure, all wild places are not the same. Some are pleasing while others are bothersome. Sometimes they're both. I like to think of wild places in the world, the words of Diane Ackerman, when she says, wild places are holy places. They keep us secluded, sprung loose from reality, separated from life's routines. Take, for example, the images on this slide. The Ganges River, the Redwood Forest, and the Great Barrier Reef. Many people would consider these places to be wild sacred and beautiful. Places such as the, these evoke something in us. They arouse us, they stimulate our senses, and can even inspire us to be better versions of ourselves. Yet with all the delight they bring to our senses, when in their midst, we should neither become too comfortable nor complacent. Unforeseeable happenings can unfold and foreign creatures can pop out out of nowhere. It's in our best interest to proceed with a sense of respect and caution. To get an even clearer sense of the complexity of the wild, let us take a moment to envision ourselves on a nature walk. Even with a map in hand, things could go awry. A storm suddenly manifests. The path muddies. Down trees block your route. Brush scrapes your ankles. Insects nip at your neck. In an instant, the wild becomes unsettling. We are called in that moment to exert extra attention and care as not to get hurt, and perhaps even to avoid hurting another. Conservationists have driven home, especially in this age of climate change and environmental degradation, that our previous ways of navigating everything that is other and wild as something to be dominated used and controlled has had disastrous effects. What's more, we've learned from the social sciences that our manipulation of the wild is not merely a result of greed, but also because of fear. We fear much of what is other or different than us. And at times we deal with this fear by deluding ourselves into thinking the wild place or wild creature is familiar and manageable, even making the other into something manageable and familiar through force and violence. 
In the first part of the 20th century, Aldo Leopold, an American conservationist and author of A Sand County Almanac, commented on the human misuse of the wild, which carries weight even into today. For Leopold, the ability to see the cultural value of wilderness boils down to a question of intellectual humility. Having intellectual humility it is, is admitting that we don't know everything about the other before us, and therefore living with a sense of respect, commitment, and willingness to learn. What if we applied the lessons about the wild from conservationists to our everyday lives? What if we framed our interpersonal relationships like forests, oceans, and deserts as unknown, mysterious, and sacred places that demand our intellectual humility? For some, conceptualizing interpersonal space as the wilderness may seem like a bit of a stretch. How is relating to one's child, partner, or colleague analogous to being in the wilderness? Here's how I'm making the comparison. Just like in the wild, in relationships, there's the potential for feeling joy and experiencing transcendence, as well as for the potential for encountering danger and undergoing suffering at the hands of the other. My argument that relationships are wild hinges on the premise that similar to the way that humans have manipulated and dominated nature for their own use and out of their own fears, individuals often fall into the trap of domesticating the sacred space between one another. When we think, about, when we think the other is just like us, we could end up become, that could be end up becoming a source of pain for them and for us. And if and when we start to become uncertain as to who they are, we tend to fall into the trap of trying to control them as a way to gain power and safety. Instead of assuming an over-familiarity in such relationships and trying to control others, might we imagine them as mysterious places where we are called to let go of all preconceived knowledge and all our fears and instead just be present with the other. There, in the presence of the other, we are challenged to observe what's going on instead of assuming this or that. What's more, in the interpersonal wild, we're called to change our minds, our hearts, and our actions. In other words, to improvise if what we observe or feel in the presence of the other is not what we had originally thought was the case. Finally, we are called to let go of all the false ego and the false sense of safety because we are in the wilderness with the other. Adjusting our frame from thinking about relationships as entities we can control and should control gives us the possibility of creating more life-affirming relationships, one fed by empathy and love. Wilderness is not something that we have to look for. Rather, what I'm trying to communicate here is that it's the sacred space between self and other in which we are called every day to open ourselves. The wilderness is where we are most of the time. That is to say, in the middle, within the liminal space between me and you. It's what Sherry Turkle, a renowned psychologist, speaks about when she writes, we live our lives in the middle of things. This could be the middle of an intimate relationship with another person, with God. Intimacy in the middle like being in the wild, is not always pleasurable. Sometimes it's tense, precarious, and uncomfortable. And it is there, in the middle of our intimate relationships, where we find ourselves immersed in our desires for love and in our fears about failure, hoping for a better future and grieving for the losses of the past. That's our wilderness. We're in the middle of something, raising children, providing care for ailing parents, in the middle of a marriage, a job, a celebration. And we're always in the middle of relationships in these settings. 
The notion of midlife crisis is an important idea, but I think it's a bit overdone because it can lead, mislead someone to think that we only have one middle in our lives. When we're always in the middle of something, unsettling situations and complicated relationships. In his work on aesthetics, George Steiner describes the predicament of being in the middle in terms of a Saturday experience. He writes, quote, but ours is the long journey of the Saturday between suffering, aloneness, an unutterable waste on the one hand, and dream of liberation on the other. He urges us to ponder that after the work of Friday and before the celebration of Easter Sunday, there is Saturday, the liminal position of being as being in the middle. The middle and Saturday are two more ways of speaking about interpersonal wilderness. It's probably becoming apparent by now that the notions of the wild and wilderness have both literal and metaphorical dimensions. The concept of wilderness has served as an important symbol for Christians. Jesus fasts for 20 days and nights in the wilderness according to the Gospels. And in his early part of the ministry, his ministry, he's tested, if you will, to see if he can survive temptation and not give in to evil. He prevails, and like Jesus, Christians are called to tra traverse the wilderness in their own lives. Our wilderness is not the desert per se, but a type of wilderness experience in which living with others presents as a challenge for us to say yes to good and to God. Consider a challenging relationship with a partner, a child, your boss, an employee, a parent. Often individuals feel like they should have it all figured out and under control. And when things happen, bad things happen, uncomfortable situations arise, there's panic and denial, at least potentially. Instead of thinking we should have it together, could we envision ourselves as embarking on a journey into the unknown, where we'll be faced with tests, challenges, and queries, Often we don't know what the other wants, and that probably scares us, so we'd rather leave the relationship than stay. Or it may be the case that we're too frightened to show the other what we need, so we decide to leave. Interpersonal wilderness is the place where uncertainty and sacred vulnerability abound, and our job is to find a way to reside in this wilderness. One of the ways to reside there is to demonstrate intentionality by being vigilant, observing, and paying attention. Simone Weil, a French philosopher who lived in the early 20th century, wrote about the importance of attention. For Weil, being attentive is what she called the purest form of generosity. This idea makes me pause. Because to pay attention is, in critical moments demands commitment and care, important aspects of any love relationship. And as we all know, to observe is not easy. It's a practice and a way of being for the other, loving the other in the wilderness. In addition to being attentive in the wilderness, we need to be ready to improvise. And we see the importance of improvisation as a survival strategy in the work of Dolores Williams. Her groundbreaking Christian theological book entitled Sisters in the Wilderness blends womanist theology, feminist theology, and critical race theory. And the cover of her book is in the middle panel of this slide. Williams discusses how women of color are not all that different from the slave woman Hagar in the book of Genesis. Some of you may recall that according to scripture, Hagar was forced to flee her masters, Sarah and Abraham, only to find herself alone with her son Ishmael in the wilderness. For Williams, women of color like Hagar experience wilderness in the concrete. She writes, wilderness is a near destruction situation 
in which God gives personal direction to the believer and thereby helps her make a way out of what she thought was no way. From Williams' work, we see that women of color are called to improvise in the face of suffering. And as a side note, the symbol of wilderness is so significant historically to enslaved, uh, to enslaved communities and to African American communities that um, we see these in the spirituals, we see this music, that wilderness becomes a place where God meets humans in the midst of oppression and despair. Regardless of our race or religion, religion though, in the sacred space between self and other, each one of us is called to improvise. In her work, Composing a Life, Mary Catherine Bateson, who's Margaret Mead's daughter and a writer and cultural anthropologist in her own right, discusses the power of improvisation. She surmises that many of us feel overwhelmed by everything that's going on in our life, at school, at work, at home. And we know this feeling. She says that we feel like we have to juggle it all, assuming that in order to be good and to be lovable, that we have to keep everything in control and able to handle it on our own. So we keep moving everything at once. We're juggling, forcing things to happen. From Bateson's perspective, this juggling act prevents us from leading a flourishing life. And I think many of us who experience this juggling feel uh, unfree. As an alternative, she urges us to frame the fluidity of life as an opportunity to compose a life. Composing involves being attentive to what's going on, like was already mentioned, and also being open to change. Going with the flow is one way of talking about improvisation. But, that's, but, but improvisation is not an uncaring about what's happening. On the contrary. It's because we have an investment in the relationship or the matrix of relationships that we give ourselves permission to change our mind, our heart, our course of action in the presence of the other. We're already switching gears here from theology to psychology. So I want to mention the work of Brene Brown in this discussion of wilderness as a symbol. Brown is a clinician who some of you may know uh, and she researches the areas of shame, vulnerability, and empathy. And she explains wilderness as, quote, an untamed, unpredictable place of solitude and searching. The wilderness for her can often feel unholy because we can't control it. But it turns out to be a place of true belonging. And it's the bravest and most sacred place you'll ever stand, she says. Brown presents us with a picture of emotional wilderness that we are not to avoid, but to seek in order for true freedom to emerge. In seeking the wilderness, we need to observe, improvise, and finally let go and relinquish any number of things that holds us back, including a static sense of self, a false ego, and the illusion of safety. And part of this act of letting go involves mourning. Mourning is significant because without recognizing the loss we face when we give up on certainty and we give up on pride, we can't fully be at peace with the other. For many of us, when we hear the word mourning, we picture in our mind's eye sadness and death. I want to underscore further the catharsis that accompanies mourning, the acknowledgement that whatever or whomever was lost was so significant to us, a realization that is critical in order to flourish in the wilderness. So from here on out, I suggest that we consider using these three strategies as tools for navigating the wilderness. As Brene Brown puts it, you don't walk into the wilderness unprepared. To brave the wilderness and become the wilderness, you must learn how to trust ourselves and others. So what does being prepared mean? It means first we need to make a commitment or intention to engaging that space as wild, eyes wide open. This is the paying attention and being vigilant I mentioned just a few moments ago. Second, in our commitment to the otherness of the wild, 
We need to be ready and willing to improvise in the face of the other. We take our clues from the other, change with and for them. Third, we need to give up on the privilege of being in the center of the world. We're in the wilderness and our place is precarious and uncertain. In a way, we must acknowledge and even mourn this loss of safety before we can move toward a healthier relationship and what I'm hoping for, a more empathetic way of being. So these are the three strategies I'm gonna keep on coming back to, so I just wanted to highlight them for you. Already I've put forward the idea that each one of us is in the middle, whether it's in the middle of you know, being in the middle with family, with friends, with frenemies. Now I wanna propose that each one of us has hobbies, interests, practices, that help us hone these three strategies for living in the middle. So I'm gonna share my experience, and it's my hobby of swimming. Does anybody swim? Hey, hey, great. Okay, and, and so um, I'm gonna look at swimming and see if we could talk more about being attentive, improvisation, and mourning. And not just in the water. So I began swimming regularly. Everybody has their stories about a hobby, but this is mine. I began swimming regularly at a health club several years ago after undergoing minor knee surgery. And I was at a point in my life where I wanted a new fitness routine and I wanted to reinvent myself. So um, the first few laps in the, in the pool were very awkward because I've entered a new community that have rules about swim caps and swim lanes and, and all this sort of etiquette that I never knew existed before. And um, it was interesting because once I learned the, the rules or the guidelines, I was freed up to embrace the experience of being in the water. And now each time I take the plunge, so to speak, um, all those distractions about guidelines go away and something wild happens. And it's not always pleasurable. In fact, most of the time it's unsettling. And that's the exact frame used here for approaching our relationships with others, human, non-human, and divine. These relationships are unsettling because when we dwell with others, we're in the middle of things. We're li it's like we're at a party. We enter a party that's already underway in which the guests are already mingling, the wine is flowing, the inside jokes are established, and we're just thrust into relationships. Things are in process, so much so that everything that is revealed to us needs to be engaged as part of a middle. Coincidentally, my favorite day to swim is Saturday, and this makes me think of George Steiner's work on the Saturday experience. It's usually the most strenuous workout of the week, and I muddle through Saturday swims with hopes of finishing. The epitome of in-betweenness the Saturday swim arrives after a long week of school, family responsibilities, work, unforeseen problems, and hopefully happy surprises. And like with my swim, Saturday, the actual day promises for hope, renewal, and transformation. Saturday is the day to let go and begin again. It's a day of mourning all that went wrong and trying to recreate or look forward to things that can go right. Seemingly a solitary activity, swimming is never just about the individual who's swimming, but is always a social activity that unfolds in relation to a fluid, unpredictable other. So first and foremost, if we're gonna go back to the strategies, swimming requires attention and vigilance to the water, except those aren't the words that swimmers use. They talk about getting a feel for the water. Getting a feel for the water means paying attention to it and one's position in it. When an individual enters the water, there's already a flow happening. Swimmers need to pay attention to the flow and engage that flow in the most strategic ways possible. In other, way, in other words, improvise. Finally, th there's a cyclical nature to swimming and that each swim stroke has a work aspect, a recovery aspect, and then the swimmer repeats again. 
With each stroke, the individual lets go of all that's happened and prepares anew, a mourning of sorts. So in returning to these three strategies for navigating wilderness, let's imagine the first, being attentive in terms of swimming. With each swim, I'm called to a heightened vigilance of the depth, temperature, and flow of the water. Paying attention allows me to respond to unforeseen and unexpected events. Swimmers practice paying attention by performing swimming drills and employing equipment such as paddles, bands, and buoys. While well, some people are content splashing around and getting their body to move in the water, more intentional swimmers long, log long hours on their stroke and their breathing, all in an effort to overcome what is often referred to as hydrodynamic drag. This is the resistance to the physical movement of the swimming stroke caused by the surrounding fluid. A first step in paying attention in the water is acknowledging the challenge of hydrodynamic drag. In addition to paying attention to the water and their surroundings, swimmers need to then let go, excuse me, improvise and let go of unhelpful patterns in order to move through the water more efficiently. Let's break down the swimmer stroke into two phases. There's the catch phase, and then there's the recovery phase. In the catch phase is when the hand enters the water and pushes and pulls the water to try to move through it. The recovery phase is when you come out of the water, right? And you gear up for the new entry. In an ideal situation, after recovering and before re-entering their hand, the swimmer strategizes to fix the stroke based on bodily feedback gained from swimming the previous stroke. This is where all the improvising and letting go happens. We can compare some of the aspects of swimming to everyday living with others. Just like with swimming, when trying to relate to others in the interpersonal wild, we experience an analogous form of drag, an emotional friction that complicates relating. We need to accept it and expect it even. But too often we don't. Perhaps we feel like we should have it all together, like I said before, meaning that we should have our relationships with others in order. From the outside looking in, other people seem to have their lives together. And you could just think of all social media here, people posting the best parts of their lives, and sometimes you catch that and maybe you don't feel the best about yourself. These perceptions can cause anxiety, make us feel like we're not good enough to be loved by anyone, really. This is related to the illusion that others are perfect, and to be lovable like them, we need to be perfect and downplay feelings of vulnerability. If we realize when we look deeper that everyone has experiences of drag, challenges in relating and loving, we can begin to improvise and move more smoothly through the water, through life. In addition to navigating drag, whether in the pool or in everyday life, we are constantly negotiating our place in relationship to the other, honing what clinicians refer to as proprioceptive sense. Proprioception can be defined as an awareness of one's body in relationship to the environment. Knowing where we are in relation to another is an additional way to get a feel for the other and navigate the wilderness. Swimming happens to be a sport that encourages one to be vigilant about where their body is in relationship to the other, the fluid other. Because even a small shift in one's body position could influence the efficiency of the stroke. The more one can get a feel for the water by knowing where they are in relationship to the other, the more successful and pleasurable the swim will be. Similar to the phenomenon of the swimmer who attempts to get a feel for the, where they are in connection to the water, I'm asking us to think about whether Christians might become more aware of their position in relation to other believers as well as non-believers. Realizing one is in a community with others who have different priorities, who need different space, 
is neither common sense nor natural and comes easier for some than others. Yet in our age of religious pluralism, the need to be aware of others is of the utmost importance. So we can practice these skills. This practice unfolds by paying attention to the dynamics of the other and embracing the middle as the opportunity for growth. Earlier, I mentioned the work of the conservationist Aldo Leopold and his call for intellectual humility when engaging the wild. Intellectual humility, at least metaphorically, manifests in swimming when the swimmer's hands are in the water and when the swimmer realizes that they have to stop applying pressure one way and apply something otherwise to move forward. It involves giving up on mastering the element of the water and instead paying attention to the process of engaging the water and even creating new muscle memories in the midst of stubborn and unhelpful ones. Similarly, intellectual humility occurs for those of us in intimate wild relationships when we realize we need to give up on old patterns and misguided feelings about having mastery over others, human, non-human, and divine. An individual is called to change by giving up a pattern of relating, a feeling, a wish, a sense of self, and an idea about the other so that they can move on. To be sure, intellectual humility allows us to relate to all creatures with empathy. So what I'm trying to get us to um, consider here is that those strategies of vigilance, improvisation, and letting go, which I, I think about when I swim, and maybe you, maybe you run, or maybe you sew, or maybe you do something, you can think about them, are the seeds of empathy's flourishing. And I already mentioned Brene Brown, the clinician and researcher on shame, and I'm gonna show one of her short videos now on empathy, and we can just keep that in mind as we go forward. So I have sound, I'm good. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult 
conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So there's a lot we can say about this video. Maybe it'll come out at the discussion at the end. One, per, one point noting that I like to note is that the hug was reciprocated. I don't know if you saw that. And you know, a question when you're in this wild is that you don't know what's going to be reciprocated and what isn't, um, or how something is going to be received. And so that's all part of the cost here and the risk. And um, I'm just thinking along with uh, Brene Brown, you know, it's the stakes of wilderness that they're so high that makes the reward of empathy so great. So just something that we keep in mind as we keep on thinking here. As we just continue this conversation about empathy, it's worth turning to the work of uh, Edith Stein. And I'm sure some of you have heard of her. She was canonized under John Paul II in 1998. And she's uh, a sister, Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. And why am I turning to her? Because her dissertation was entitled The Problem of Empathy. And I really feel like she's one of our greatest works on empathy today in terms of philosophy. She was born in 1891 and raised in a German Jewish family. And she studied philosophy under Edmund Husserl, who was one of the most significant phenomenologists of the 20th century. And reading her work, um, one sees that Stein was an outstanding philosopher, and probably in a different time where women were allowed to excel at the university, her story could have been very different. Potentially, she could have had a university post, and she, maybe she would have been touted as one of the greatest phenomenologists of the 20th century. However, her life took a different turn, and she converted to Christianity from atheism, and she became a Carmel Carmelite nun. And as many of you probably know, after she uh, fleed Holland, when Christians of Jewish descent were being threatened, she was unable to escape the Nazis. And in August of 1942, she and her sister were deported, and they were murdered at Auschwitz. The reasons for her canonization are worthy, worthy of a proper discussion, and for time's sake cannot happen here. So instead, I want to focus on her philosophical writings. And as I said, her dissertation was entitled The Problem of Empathy. And in this important work, she's quite clear in her assertion that empathy is an act of cognition. It's an attempt at knowing. Even knowing that one cannot fully know the situation and the accompanying feelings. In regard to interpersonal relationships, Stein's philosophy maintains the uniqueness of the other's experience. For instance, she argues that in empathic acts, quote, knowledge reaches its object but does not have it, end quote. Empathic acts for Stein are about being vulnerable and having intellectual humility in relation to the other. Blending Stein's thoughts with our discussion of interpersonal relations, we could argue that we're in the wilderness with the other and called to empathize with them, not through pretending we can feel what they feel, but admitting we don't and wanting to stay and learn more about their predicament anyway. For Stein, in empathizing, the individual becomes one perspective among many. She actually uses the terms as a spatial point among many. This means that one needs to realize that the other standpoint and other, other standpoints are worthy of consideration. They need to pay attention to the other and even change their position because of the other. And I, I wrote this quote, I have this quote up here for you because I think it's interesting. She says, if we take the self as the standard, 
we lock ourselves in the prison of our own individuality. Others become riddles for us, or still worse, we remodel them into our image and so falsify historical truth. In addition to paying attention to the other, for Stein, improvisation and letting go are important strategies too, except she doesn't call them that. She, she does argue that at times individuals need to correct their empathic acts. When a person smiles, it may not mean happiness. We need to dig deeper. Beyond the smile is the individual's body language communicating another story. For Stein, there's no shame in being wrong as long as one stays open to the relationship as well as being corrected by the other. An American essayist and novelist, Leslie Jameson, in her work, The Empathy Exams, demonstrates a deep sense of empathy that resonates with much of what has been said here relative to knowing the other without mastering the other. For Jameson, after admitting for the larger part of her life that she had de defined empathy as feeling another's pain, so that was her original thought, that empathy was feeling another's pain, she, changed her, she changes her perspective. What happens is she undergoes a couple of medical interventions, and during those times, probably like others, you know, I've, I've gone through things and I, I want people to feel my pain because I feel like if they feel my pain that we're close and they understand me. And so she searched for comfort for the assurance of people around her, including her physicians, her family, her boyfriend named Dave. And uh, not surprisingly, she felt disappointment for they didn't seem to know exactly what she was going through. And that not knowing felt like distance to her and even a rejection of her. She wanted the loved ones to show they cared for her by feeling what she felt. But as I said, she eventually has this change of heart and mind as her boyfriend Dave reveals to her a higher purpose for empathy, namely just being there. Jameson writes, quote, Dave doesn't believe in feeling bad just because someone else does. This isn't his notion of support. He believes in listening and asking questions and steering clear of assumptions. He thinks imagining someone else's pain with too much surety can be as damaging as failing to imagine it. He believes in humility. She says, I remember lying tangled with him, how much it meant that he was willing to lie down in the mess of wires to stay there with me. Dave teaches Jameson about the grace of the Saturday, in which one is thrust into a fluid relationship with the other, in which neither party knows everything about the other and stays there anyway. That's true empathy, communion with the other in the midst of not knowing, in the midst of tangledness in the wilderness. I'm just gonna end tonight with a little gentle plea that like most of you think, we probably need empathy now more than ever. We need to find ways to listen and speak with one another across dinner tables, boardrooms, parishes and schools in very uncomfortable situations and about very uncomfortable topics. Empathy emerges when we give up on the desire to master the other and what they're saying and trying to just sort of control what they're saying. When we, met, when we give up on mastery, we risk our emotional and spiritual safety to remain in that relationship. When we are empathetic, we attempt to get a feel for the other without making any claims to the status of the other. In fact, empathy emerges when we relinquish power over that other, mourn that power, and let the other have an impact on us, and perhaps even reveal something about ourselves that we never knew. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, we have some time for conversation. I'm going to suggest you take one minute to chat with one another, and then we will pick up uh, from there. So one one minute silent, or one minute's chat, and then we'll talk to Michelle.
Okay, so there's some conversation going on here, and Joe's got his hand up, so Joe. I'd just like to know what is it about the space between us that makes it sacred space? It's an excellent question. It's sacred because it's mysterious. It calls us into question. It calls us to vigilance. And uh, it's a place of deep contemplation and prayer. I mean, every time we encounter someone, we're not saying this is a place of deep contemplation and prayer, right? But if we really observed, it is. It is that place where we're, where we're, we're not in control. Now, whether we call that God intervening or not, I mean, I think that's what you're getting at. Like, is God there? I would say, yes, that is, that is a place, that mystery, that deep not knowing. Um, I would say yes. It's a good question, though. So I'm listening, and what you say seem, makes a lot of sense to me when we're thinking about you know, an encounter with someone. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I want to go back, just put my question, I go back to your swimmer, swimming up and down laps. Yeah. Isn't, the, isn't it the case that, aside from what you said about the swimmer, that he, he it was a he, right? Mm -hmm. He is actually getting better at what he does and consequently is less in an alien space or in an alien medium as time goes on. So, in other words, this is where I want to put my question. Mm -hmm. Where's the teleology in what you're saying, right? Is, I, it's, it's kind of, I'd say it's agonistic. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to hear, so in, in deep friendships, in long-term loving relationships of one kind or another, isn't there a movement towards less of these, I don't know what to call them, tensions or, or whatever? Do you see what I'm asking you? Yes, and I'll try to answer it the best way possible. The, this, yes, the swimmer gets better, right? But the water is always changing. So... A good swim one day might not be such a good swim. Day. But, but the technique could be better. So that's a problem with the metaphor, right? The swimmer gets better. Now, in interpersonal relationships where you're familiar with the person, that's what you, you want to know, right? Do you get better? I think the, the person, you, the subject, gets more sophisticated at paying attention gets more sophisticated at improvising, gets more, I think they develop the skills, just like the swimmer develops the skills. But that situation is always changing. And I think one of the problems at least I make, and I, I, I'm assuming other people make, is that while we meet someone who, in an encounter who's different, you know, sure, it would benefit us to observe and improvise and all that. But often we take the people in our most everyday lives and interpersonal relationships, I don't want to say for granted because that's not going, we think we know what's happening all the time. And I think, no, there we need vigilance. There we need improvisation. There because we can fall into the trap. So I don't think it's just encounter. I would really resist that. And I'm sorry if I went that way with it. I think in our deepest relationships is where we're called to pay attention. And, you know, if we want to go theological, perhaps it's sinful when we don't pay attention, right? When we miss that opportunity. So that's just some reflections. I think I need this. Do I need this? I do. So I was wondering about the this concept of otherness. So um, I think that it's, there's, for this real empathy to develop, there has to be some mutuality about the otherness, mm -hmm. that not only do I have to recognize the other in you, but that I come to you as other, so that your experience of me is as other. 
especially the farther, the more distance there is between us in one way or another. And that, that, um, that, that my ability to be really intentional and, and ob observant and aware um, and empathetic requires me also to know that my presence to you is in some way other. Um, and so just a thought I was having. And then the, the other thing I was thinking about was what you were just saying is sometimes when in those most intimate relationships, we sort of forget that there's otherness there, that you're not the same as whoever your, you know, your spouse, your children, somebody like that. And so you, yeah, you might be, you know, pretty good at paying attention when you're with someone who's, you know, definitely a different person, different in a, so one way or another, but harder when you're in those intimate places. Thank you. I really want to go to your first point. Um, I think that's really insightful. But how do you present yourself as other? That's great. And you're right. And that's not in here, right? So that's a missing piece. But it's really important. I mean, that's part. Uh, you could we could say it's part of the intellectual humility to know that you're you are other, right? That that's a big step in it. That you're you're not coming into it. You know, you are other, but that's a whole different level of self-reflection going on there. And it's really giving up, you really have me thinking now, it's really giving up on pride and certainty and status. And so much of it goes, goes to yeah. the notion of privilege. Yes. That particularly people like myself are walking around with. That, you know, when you're in relationship with others, you expect them to sort of respond the way you would respond because of the power privilege that I have. Right. And I think, I th obviously, you know, we're all talking about privilege and all the dynamics around that today, right? Um, and that's where the mourning piece is really important, I think, because if, if we actually present ourselves as other and we're, each one of us has privilege in one way or another, right? So we, and we recognize that and we try to sort of, let it go before we enter, you know, as we enter into it. That's like a bummer. Like, privilege is great, right? I, I don't mean it like that, but I'm just saying, like, that's something that we are so used to. So that's the mourning piece. Like, I think there has to be an honesty that we've gotten a lot from that. And uh, to get something deeper, we need to let it go, but we got something from it. I don't know either. It's on and it's off. It's probably the way I'm holding it. That's a great, that was great. Thank you. <laughs> All right, well listen, thank you very much. Michelle, can we have a round of applause for Michelle? <laughs> And before you leave, we have uh, a custom of announcing next year's speaker. So uh, next year's speaker is someone with whom you probably are not familiar. Her name is uh, Trisha Bruce, and she teaches at a little school in Tennessee called Maryville. Yep, yep, that's small. But... Um, but um, I met her actually originally when she was a grad student in uh, UCAL Santa Barbara, where she was doing her doctoral dissertation on Voice of the Faithful. And she wrote her first book on Voice of the Faithful. It was called Faithful Revolution, How Voice of the Faithful is Changing the Church. That was in 2011. And her most recent book is called Parish and Place making room for diversity in the American Catholic Church. She's a wonderful speaker, and we look forward to seeing her here in a year's time on the first Wednesday in October, and all of you too, and bring a friend. Thank you. Thank you again, Michelle.